every week it's a fight with something. So, good evening, everybody. Good to see you guys. Our cross country travelers are back. Woo. All right, welcome to Freedom Calvary's Wednesday night service. I am Carl, and tonight we are continuing in our series on the life, chronological life of Jesus across all four Gospels. We are quickly approaching the end, and tonight we are in John chapter 18. Sort of. Ah. Uh, yeah, I, was, I meant to bring, um, like, four bookmarks for everybody, and I completely forgot. Um, we're going to be doing a lot of flip-flopping today, so. Okay, so Heather, uh, Heather's going to work on, on getting some bookmarks for people, so you guys who are watching somewhere else... I would recommend four bookmarkers because we're going to be flipping back and forth between, I think, all four Gospels tonight. So, And I think you'll understand why. We get a really, really complete picture of everything that happens this night, but we really have to go to all four Gospels to get it. So... Um, we're calling our ba base text John 18, and we'll pick up there in verse 2. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am. And Jesus, who betrayed him, Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now when he said to them, I am, they drew back and fell to the ground. Then he asked them again, Whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spoke of those whom you gave me. I have lost none. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? This is the word of the Lord. Father, uh, gosh, it's good to be among your people. Good to be back with that presence that you promise when people gather in your name as we do here tonight. Motley, Lord, we ask that your spirit would fill this place, that you would show us the truth of everything that's here, that you would speak to us and, and, and make it be more than just stories or words. Make it be what it should be, which is time with you, which is a window into who you are what you care about and what you love so that we might draw closer to you. That's what we ask for, Lord, is, is time with you tonight. Fill this place, fill the places where you're, we're being watched remotely with your spirit. Let us all leave here knowing that we've been in the presence of the living God. And all this I ask in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen. So, we watched last week as our hero prepared himself for the suffering that is about to befall him. After an entire evening of preparing the eleven for what was to come, Jesus shifted and focused upon making sure that he was ready. 
His entire preparation regimen consisted of prayer. We saw Jesus suffering greatly under the weight of the knowledge of the horror that is about to come his way. We saw that the weight of it all uh, coming down on him had him on the verge of physical collapse. While his spirit is completely willing to accept what is coming, his body is cracking under the load. Jesus' spirit is divine, but his body is not superhuman. It is as fragile and as weak as anyone else's is. He is painfully aware of this and, and that what is to come will require strength beyond what his body can endure. And in that human frailty, he asked God the Father if there is another way. And if there is another way, would, he, would God choose that for him instead? Jesus received an answer from God the Father. It's, it's not a direct answer as we might look for it, but it was an answer. And that answer came in the form of an angel sent from God the Father who, who strengthened Jesus. While it's, again, not a direct answer, it told Jesus what he needed to know, that there is no other way to accomplish God's purposes. And while it included suffering for Jesus, he will not be doing it alone. He will be the whole time under the care of and receive the full support of God the Father who will ensure that he can endure what lies ahead. Jesus was sent here to defend the reputation of God and make salvation possible while maintaining God's righteousness by dying in our place. <clears throat> With that sending came provision for the task and this time it was in the form of an angel strengthening his body and mind. We also saw that when we need support, the best place to go is God. People will let you down. Even people who love you deeply will let you down. Jesus asked the three people that he was absolutely closest to in this world to just watch his back while he prayed support him in his time of distress and, and, and they all fell asleep. He even woke them up once and asked them again to support him and told one of them, hey, there's something in this for you because you need to be praying. And when he came back the third time, they were out cold. Second time, they were out cold and he just left them after that. By contrast, when Jesus asked God the Father to have his back, there was immediate provision. And that provision was just what Jesus needed at that moment. He, even if it was not what he'd gone in looking for in the first place, Jesus emerges from his time of prayer and waiting with his resolve strengthened and his face sternly set to face the cross. So we see even with Jesus... That God does not always give us what our bodies want and cry out for, he all, but he always gives us exactly what we need to do what we have to do for the greater good in our lives and in the lives of others. So we left off last week with Jesus in the garden, called Gethsemane, on the side of the Mount of Olives, waking his disciples by telling them that his betrayer is at hand. And we pick up this week to find Jesus' betrayer and a posse from the ruling elite in Jerusalem coming to arrest him. Now, our main passage this week is from John's Gospel account. There are parallel accounts of this event, and this is where I would put your markers. Matthew chapter 26, verses 47 through 56, but I would just mark Matthew 26. Mark chapter 14 verses 43 through 52, and Luke 22, verses 47 through 53. And we're going to splice in parts from their accounts as we... Matthew 26, Mark 14, and Luke 22. And uh, we're going to splice parts in and get a really complete picture of what happens this night. 
So from here, and, and, and I'm throwing in a caveat, from here to the end of Jesus' time, the absolute precise order of things in the four gospel accounts is going to get harder to piece together. None of the accounts contradict one another in any way, shape, or form. And on the main points, they're almost identical. But there are some details that are unique to a particular writer's accounts. They all absolutely happened, and they're of great value for us to look at, or God would not have included them. But piecing together the exact order in which they took place can prove to be a challenge. I have, as you know, been following the timeline of the Reese Chronological Study Bible, but there is some slight difference of opinion. You, you can pick out any five chronological timelines of the Bible, and they're going to differ here and there. Um, I'm working with that and other sources to give the best sequence of events that I can, given the actual clues within the text, which is always what I, I look at first, and, and then my sources. So you might find another source that tells you that this happened in a slightly different order, and, and I'm not insisting that the, our order is absolutely correct. I'm working within the limitations of my understanding and counting on God to steer me where he wants me to go. So you may find someone that says, no, that, no, it's back. Okay, I'm good with that. It happened, and, and, and the impact and the meaning, uh, very much the same. So that's going to be more of a factor as we move forward from here because there's a whole lot of things going on in the background and at the same time and, and who cuts in what where to to this almost side view like peter's denial of jesus two of the gospels listed as all happening at once john shows it clearly split up that his first denial was over here and his next two were over here so is one incorrect no they just chose to put it all together and john so that's the kind of thing we're going to be facing as we get closer to the cross is, is so many things happening in the background and, and to the side. So bear with me. Pick up in John chapter 18, verses 2 and 3. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place. For Jesus often met there with his disciples. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. So I am, I absolutely do not believe that Judas knew that Jesus and the rest of the 12, the 11, were going to Gethsemane that night. And the text, I think, bears that out. Even at the end of the Last Supper, Jesus did not say, get up, we're going here. He said, let's get out of here. Get up and get ready. And I think it's this prudent exit um, that allows Jesus to have more time with the 11 for the farewell discourse and his prayer and his time in prayer. But imagine the look on Judas's face when he gets to the house with the upper room with officials from the temple and a detachment of Roman soldiers all expecting to find Jesus and the room is empty. I'm sorry, I kind of, I think that's hilarious. <laughs> Jesus just flips the whole script on him. And, and so at that point, Judas scrambled to figure out where Jesus might be and, and, and leads him out of the semi, city to Gethsemane because he often met there with his disciples, which I find interesting as well because Jesus had spent so little time in Jerusalem during his ministry. He was there very early in his ministry for Passover. Um, that's when the meeting with Nicodemus took place in uh, John 3.16. And, um, and that was before some of the disciples were even called. Uh, Matthew in particular was not called until after that point. And it was before the 12 apostles were named, which was just before the Sermon on the Mount. So that first one, I, I don't know how that happened. Um, and the next trip was the feast uh, for the Feast of Dedication just six months prior to this. And he went secretly, I believe, without the Twelve. And then he went out for Hanukkah. And he was not in the city for the entire feast um, before he was confronted by the religious leaders who tried to stone them in the portico of the temple. And he got out of town. 
in his, his very next and last visit to Jerusalem was on Triumphal Entry Sunday, four days prior to this. So if he, he met there often with the disciples, it was mostly during this week, which leads me to believe that Gethsemane was the setting for the Olivet Discourse as well. It's fascinating that Judas was able to find him this night. Um, there was no record of any discourse about, hey, go do what you're going to do, and when you're ready, we'll be over here. There, there was none of that. The fact that Judas found him this night um, is interesting. Verse 4. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? So Jesus, who just a little while earlier was physically ill to the point that blood vessels in his face were bursting under the strain such that he was sweating blood, has, has now been strengthened by God the Father through an angel. And he walks out to meet the men who are coming to arrest him. And rather than shy away or flee, he, he steps up. I'm, come, I'm ready. And this isn't a safety patrol. These aren't out guys out just happen to be out in, in the forest that night. This is a posse. This is, this is an arresting party, and it's, it's quite obvious, um, coming with weapons and torches, that at the ready, to know what all they have, um, they're out. They're ready. They're locked, cocked, and ready to arrest. And in the face of it, Jesus shows no fear. No fear at all. Verses 5 and 6. They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now when he said to them, I am, they drew back and fell to the ground. So, um... The throng, or, or more likely a spokesman for the throng, responds to Jesus' inquiry by saying, we're here for that Jesus of Nazareth guy. And this is interesting. Jesus' formal name, the way he should have been addressed, was, Joseph ben, was Yeshua ben Joseph. Jesus, son of Joseph. That is how they should have addressed him. That's how they would have addressed anyone else that they were looking for. could have at least said we're looking for Rabbi Jesus. Something, you know, some, some sense of respect for his position. Instead, they refer to Jesus as Jesus of Nazareth, which is meant to be a slur. Nazareth was considered a town of ill repute. If you remember when Philip was telling Nathaniel to come check out this Jesus guy from Nazareth, and Nathaniel goes, can anything good come out of Nazareth? <laughs> the, the, the rhetorical answer being no. The, the town of Nazareth was a byword and a slur, especially among the sophisticated people of Jerusalem, who were the ones here to arrest him. And then what happens next is, is, is truly, truly, truly remarkable. Now, many of your Bibles probably say, I am he. And I hope that the he is in italics. Because that is not there in the original text. It was added by translators to make it flow better. And frankly, they missed the point. Why is that significant? Jesus simply says, I am. See why this is significant? We need to go back to Exodus three thirteen and 14, and I'll read that to you. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent you to me, sent me to you. 
This is the very first time in the scriptures, apparently, that anyone actually thought to ask God if he had a name. Which is astounding, but everyone else just knew that's the guy. That's God. And God responds more by describing himself at first and giving an actual name that actually wouldn't come till the next verse. And in the next verse, he says, my name is Yahweh. And, and it was, it's a derivative of I am. Elohim, God simply says, I am, I exist, I am existence. The implications of, of, of God saying, I just, I am. Do I really need a name? Do I really? This is the way that God first ever expressed who he is to man. First guy to think, hey, who are you? I mean, Abraham, never thought to ask that. Isaac, Jacob, none of those guys, they all had encounters with God and never thought to ask I call you? Who, you know, if I'm going to claim your name, I need a name. And Moses was the first guy to go, hey, who are you? And it is this ancient first ever expression of the personage of God that Jesus responds with. In Hebrew, it would be haya, and in Greek, it would be ego eme. Um, don't know positive which one um, Jesus spoke that night. But if you look at the Septuagint, which is the Greek, that word was ego, ema. Hebrew Bible, haya. Jesus responded to them that you have not come after a nobody from a nothing town. You have come after God. And you could try and say that Jesus was just responding in plain language that, that he was the one. And, and he does that very plainly in the next sentence, in his second response. But at first, it's just, I am. And what happens next should tell you that it wasn't just any response. Now, now, now the general reading of this is, is that when Jesus said this, that they all fell over backwards, that the power just blew them over. And that's possible. But it's not how I see it. Because they drew backwards. So indeed, as Jesus spoke this, they drew backwards. They recoiled in the face of the power that was released when God proclaimed himself. But when they fell to the ground, I don't believe it was backward. I believe it was forward onto their knees because of the power that was released as the incarnation of God pronounced himself to them. You can't help it. When sinful men is confronted by the infinite and holy creator God, they have no choice but to bow down before him. And this really sets the tone for everything that follows. In a few minutes, these men will fall on Jesus, bind him and lead him away if Jesus could have wiped them out, forced them to their knees with words from his mouth. Is Jesus being arrested or is Jesus surrendering himself to them? Jesus in so many ways could have...
One, two. Testing. Hello. All right. Try it again. Okay, still in John 18, verses 8 and 9. Jesus answered, I've told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled, which he spoke, of those whom you gave, have, those whom you gave me, I have lost none. So even now, even now, Jesus is looking after those whom he loves. It's not out of the realm of possibility that although they came for Jesus, that they would also take, that they would arrest those who were found to be with him at the time of his. In fact, that's what usually happens in these types of situations, guilty by association, but not here. It seems actually very odd that only Jesus winds up in chains this night especially considering what's about to unfold in the coming moments. But it is prophecy, and no matter how impossible or how unlikely something seems in a situation, if God says that is how it is going to go down, then that is how it is going to go down. Now, Jesus said this during his priestly prayer a few hours earlier in the night, and we talked about how it looked like Jesus kept all but one um, which would be Judas. And here John says that all that God gave to Jesus were kept, which has to confirm the conclusion that we came to them uh, that Judas was not among those given to Jesus, or he would have been kept. So in a few hours, Judas will die a horribly gruesome death, um, and the 11 will endure. Judas was not among those given to Jesus. He was a hanger-on who was out for his own gain, the ends of which serve God's purposes. So here we're going to break from John's narrative and cut back and forth across the other Gospels to see everything that happens next. It's possible that I have the order of which just happened in reverse order with what I'm about to give. Um, I think I'm correct, but looking at the text of all four accounts, this is the order in which I really believe everything went down. So now we're going to go to Matthew 26, 48. Matthew 26, 48. Now his betrayer had given them a sign saying, whomever I kiss, he is the one sees him. So this verse is background information, which probably happened before Judas led the posse out to find Jesus. But it is really interesting. You would think that you wouldn't think that anyone would need to identify Jesus. He, at this point, is public enemy number one in Israel for sure, if not, I'm sorry, in Jerusalem for sure, if not all of Israel. He's wanted. You'd think that everyone involved would know what he looks like. At least you would think that Jesus would stand out from the crowd, that it would be obvious when they got there who Jesus was. This is the guy we're after. But that's actually not really the case. Jesus was not what we would call a, a physical specimen like Saul was. He did not have a halo around his head as some of the iconic paintings of him depict. The truth is that Jesus looked decisively average. He really was an everyman who, who looked like everyone else. Physically, Jesus was average looking. The APB on Jesus would have read, Be on the lookout for a Jewish man in his early 30s of average height, average complexion, average weight, with a beard, long hair, who does miracles and claims to be equal with God. That narrows it down quite a bit, doesn't it? And that is as it was foretold in Isaiah 53, 2. 
for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Jesus was average, perhaps a touch on the ugly side. I don't mean to be sacrilegious to say that. It's just a fact. Jesus had no physical advantages. He was not particularly tall, muscular, or even handsome. He was plain and average. And thus the need for Judas to identify him. Continuing in Matthew 26, verse 49. Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Once everyone stands up from getting knocked to their knees, Judas steps forward to earn his 30 pieces of silver. This is his moment. And the gall of this turns my stomach. To walk up and address Jesus like he meant something to him. As a way to identify him as the one they should arrest is... is It's as diabolical of, of a thing as I've ever witnessed in my life. And it's why his name in, in this event has become a byword across history, a way of depicting the ultimate betrayal. And the gall, he could have just stood back and pointed, that's the guy you want over, no, not that, that one, that one. To, to choose, he didn't have to do this. Like he has no conscience at all. We all know people like this. They are one way to your face, but behind your back, they're plotting against you. And I'm not even sure that's an equal comparison because Judas is betraying Jesus to his face. All while feigning friendship to get it over on Jesus. I, I don't know any other way to, to describe this than pathological. Matthew 26, 50. But Jesus said to him, Friend, why have you come? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. Jesus knows why Judas has come. He announced it at dinner. Before Jesus got up to walk over here, he said, My betrayer is at hand. And look how Jesus addresses him. His friend. And, 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 and you could argue maybe he doesn't know why he's, he's here. But actually, Luke twenty two forty eight 48 tells us that Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? He knew exactly what was going on. Exactly. And he still addresses him as a friend. Was Jesus being sarcastic or contemptuous? I really don't think so. It would be completely inconsistent with Jesus' character. I firmly, totally believe Jesus absolutely meant what he said. What I really believe is that Jesus was holding out one last chance for Judas to turn. One last chance for Judas to have his soul saved. And if Jesus had hit him with, with what he deserved, what are you doing here, you piece of garbage? There had been no chance. Judas would have been confirmed in what he was doing and, and felt good about it. Instead, he got treated like a friend like someone that Jesus loved. And in that moment, I am positive that Jesus did. One last chance to save his soul. And it wouldn't have changed the course of events for this night. It's too late. It would have happened anyway. Jesus wasn't trying to save himself. That was, it was beyond the point of no return. But he was reaching out with one last chance opportunity for Judas to repent and confess his sin right there and be forgiven. I, I can't
can't even fathom that. But as we'll see in a few weeks, Judas does not respond to this one last offer from Jesus. Jesus himself to turn. And with that, the men, Judas is led there, begin falling on Jesus. Flip over to Luke chapter 22. Be here for verse 49. And those around him saw what was going to happen. They said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? So the disciples see what's going down, that Jesus is going to be arrested, and they're asked, should we fight back? And they are armed. They only have two swords, but they have two swords between the 11 of them. Luke 22, uh, 36 through 38 tells us that they took two swords that night. So they want to know if now is the time that Jesus told them was coming just before they set off to go to the Mount of Olives. Is is this when we fight? Is this when we fight? Back over to John 18, please. Pick up where we left off in verse 10. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So before Jesus can even answer, immediately, Peter, the impetuous Peter, pulls out one of the two swords and just starts swinging. Now, the other three gospel accounts only tell us that someone cut off the high priest's servant's ear. They do not tell us who it was, but John here tells us specifically that it was Peter. And obviously, he is not a soldier for a reason. There is a reason he's a fisherman, because he is not worth a darn with a sword. (laughs) I mean, how awkward with that thing must you be to manage to only cut off your opponent's ear? I mean, it's a thrusting thing. You, 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 was he aiming for the head and was off to the right a little? Uh, his left? I, I, I mean, don't you go for the bot? He's here to defend Jesus from arrest and lopping off ears is really not a prudent path to victory. How can someone actually be that bad with a sword? No, I don't even think you could, dear. And I make that point because I don't think he was that bad with a sword. I really believe this moment is divine intervention. And further, it's even more remarkable after this that Peter isn't arrested along with Jesus. The fact that Jesus is the only person arrested this night can also only be explained as divine intervention. Now, the mention of this man's name who was injured by Peter lets us know, one, that this is a firsthand account. John was there and saw all of this happen. And two, we should take note of this name. because It's going to come up again in the future. Verse 11 of John 18. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? Now long before this, Jesus was asking for this cup to pass him. And now he is fully committed to drinking it. And that cup is the cup filled with God's wrath. The wrath that belongs to those who have rejected God. And Jesus is by choice drinking that on our behalf. But I don't want you to miss this last line. Who has placed this cup into Jesus' hand to drink? It is not the high priest, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the elders, the Sanhedrin, the Romans, Judas, Annas, Caiaphas, Herod Antipas, or even Pilate who has given this cup to Jesus to drink. They think they're in control of what's happening here. But if God did not desire it to happen, it would Jesus is drinking the cup of God's wrath because God 
has placed it in his hands. Now, back over to Matthew 26. I'm going to pick up in verse 52. But Jesus said to him, Put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. So, um, a lot of ways you can go with this. Is this a, a big overarching statement, or is, is this for the time? And, and so you have to ask, are there times when we must resort to defending ourselves against those who seek to do us harm? And that answer has to be yes, because Jesus told the 11 that they would need to sell their cloak and buy a sword if they did not have one. Why would he do that if there were not times when it was appropriate to use it? Should it be our first resort? Absolutely not. If you take up the sword, are you likely to die by the sword? And the answer to that is, of course. And this is really a, a more nuanced topic than, than we have time for tonight. Um, while a time may arise when the apostles need to take up arms to defend themselves, I don't think that's what this is about this night. Tonight is not that night. Verse 53. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? So I mentioned earlier that there were, there were so many ways Jesus could have stopped this process had he wanted to. And here is another one. Jesus, at this moment, could have asked his father. And I'm sure it would have just been an outcry. Jesus, Father, I need angels. And he calls it a prayer. Interesting. What we think of as praying and what Jesus perhaps thinks of as praying. And that, that, that request would have been fulfilled immediately. And one... One would have been more than enough. We, we saw in the Old Testament what one angel could do in one night with an army. And, and Jesus is like, I, I, I could have 12 times a legion. And I, I, there were 12 of them there that night, 11 apostles plus Jesus. I could have a legion of angels for every one of us that is here tonight plus more now a roman legion is 5200 infantrymen times 12 62400 angels plus and again one would be more than enough to wipe out this little ragtag band that's come to take jesus the point Jesus is trying to make to Peter is I can stop this anytime I want to. So the fact that I have not done that has to tell you that this is happening because I want it to. <clears throat> Put away your sword. I don't want you to get hurt. I got this. Verse 54. How then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? Finally, Jesus tells Peter, not only could I stop this at any moment I want to, this is happening because I want it to, but it's happening because it has to happen. And it has to happen this way. And we'll come back to that idea at the end. Luke chapter 22, please. Back to verse 51. But Jesus answered and said, Permit even this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Now Jesus is still speaking to Peter here. He's told him, put away his sword so that he does not get hurt in all of this. And that he could end all of this in a moment if he wanted to. And, and, and that this is happening because it must. So Peter for your sake, and because it is mine and my Father's will that this happen, stop struggling against this and just let it happen. 
And it got me thinking, it, 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 as soon as those words came to my head, you know, that while this is a really extreme example, I wonder how many times in my own life God has tried to do the same thing to me. And grab me by the face and go, would you please stop struggling and just let this happen? I know it isn't what you want. I know it isn't what you think should go down. It's my will. It's what has to happen. Would you please stop fighting so that you don't get hurt? Just let this happen. And a couple of events in my life just kind of popped into my head. Or maybe if I'd have been listening, I could have heard the words of God, would you please? Please stop fighting. You're just making it worse. Not going to stop this. It's what has to happen. Please stop struggling. Please stop fighting this. And then look, what Jesus does. He heals the ear of the man who has come to lead him to his torture and death. And this is this is stunning. I, I, middle of all of this, Jesus stops to heal those who would do him harm. How, how do you do that? I, the kindness, the mercy, and the love that is on display from Jesus right here in this moment is simply beyond belief. And you contrast that against those that have, have gathered now. And how filled with hate must their hearts be that, that when they saw this go down, how could they still arrest him? That dude lopped that dude's ear off and he just put it back on. And then there was that whole fallen over thing when he said his just out of self-preservation, maybe I should go. Maybe this isn't the best place for me to be tonight. <laughs> I'm not sure I want any part of this. And they arrested him anyways. I, the illogical way that people act when their hearts are filled with hate. The self-preserving thing would have been to leave. <laughs> this is not a fight I want any part of. Just self-preservation, but the hate that was being driven by the religious leaders who had come with them doesn't even allow them to act in their own best interest. Because at any moment, Jesus could have unleashed anything. And they'd have been gone. And he'd already given them tastes of that. This is what unadulterated hate and evil filling your heart will, will cause you to do. There is one more thing to see here. This really gets Peter off the hook. It would be hard to bring charges against Peter for assaulting the high priest's servant when there's no injury. So even as he is being arrested unjustly, Jesus is merciful, kind, loving, and still protecting those he loves. Still in Luke 22, verses 52 and 53. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, captains of the temple, and the elders who had come to him, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you daily in the temple, you did not try to seize me. This is your hour in the power of darkness. So he does turn to those who have come to arrest him and points out their treachery. There has been a standing order in place from Caiaphas, the high priest, to arrest Jesus on sight 
since right after the raising of Lazarus from the dead. There's, that uh, APB wasn't something I made. It's, it's a fact. He was supposed to be arrested on site. Months now. Jesus has been in the city for the last four days. They have confronted him, but did not move to arrest him even once over those four days. Why? Because they knew. They absolutely knew that they had no just cause upon which to arrest him. And if they had tried, the people would have risen up against them. Now, thieves and robbers operate under the cover of darkness. And so that's when you have to go out and pursue them. Jesus has operated openly in the daylight, in the city, in the temple, openly in front of all of these. He has absolutely nothing to hide. Everything he has said and done is absolutely true and right. So, so why come out? after him under the cover of darkness because they are the ones doing wrong and they are covering their sins, their iniquity by doing what they do while people sleep. This is the power of darkness that has consumed the hearts of the leaders of Israel there. They are not concerned with what is right or what is just. They are out to do what is best for them. They don't believe in Jesus. They don't believe that he's God. They don't know God. They can't know him at all. Or they would see that he's standing there in their midst. All they know is that Jesus is a threat to the order of things. An order which has elevated them to power. Jesus is a threat to their power and thus a threat to their wealth. Which they have because of their positions of power. They love money and they love power because it gets them money. So Jesus has to go. And if they have to resort to skullduggery and crawling around under the cover of darkness to get it done, they will. And they have. And Jesus makes sure to tell them that what they are doing is wrong. One last turn. Back to Matthew 26. Matthew 26, 56. But all of this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled, then all the disciples forsook him and fled. When we hear the word prophecy, I, I think, I, I know the first thing that comes to my mind is, is some prediction of the future, a prediction. Sometimes they come true and sometimes they don't. Sometimes little pieces of them and, you know, prediction. But a prophecy from God is not really a prediction of the future. It's, it's a foretelling of what he is going to do at a given time. It's a promise. God does not tell us what he's going, what is going to happen so much as he tells us what he is going to do or cause to happen. And from the first prophecy of the Christ in Genesis 3 through to the pictures painted in the Passover events to the words of the prophets and their writings and the words of the psalmist, God has been telling us that what he was going to cause to happen and it's happening right now, just as he said it would. Even the disciples fleeing and leaving Jesus to face his fate alone was predicted in Psalm 69 and by the prophets. All of this had to happen because God said that he would do it. And God never speaks falsely. Noah's a lot of jumping, but that is a really complete picture of everything that unfolds in the arrest of, of Jesus. 
Two things I want to I want to point out from this from these passages, really. Things that jumped out at me that I want to share with you. One, first one. Despite the incredibly tremendous stress that is occurring in this moment, Jesus's personality does not change. Everything that Jesus has been during his ministry is still on display in this moment. He's protecting those whom he loves. At the very beginning, he steps up and draws attention away from the other 11. On me, eyes on me, deal with me. Protecting the, the rest of them. And then he tells Peter to put down his sword. And the, and the answer really was that the, he who lives by the side dies by the sword. That was Peter, put it down, you're going to get hurt. They're going to start swinging back, and you're obviously not very good at this. Put it down. Even taking the time to reason with him. Jesus is protecting those who, who he loves and who love him. And he's being compassionate to sinners. <laughs> Judas, <laughs> he addresses as a friend. And then he reaches down and heals the high priest servant's ear. And he's still warning others about their sin. He lets those assembled against them know that they are acting under the power of dark forces. As much as he was calling them out, he's warning them. Do you know what you're doing? You know what the consequences of this is going to be? I don't know about the rest of you, but when I get stressed, sometimes it affects me. And I start thinking and saying and doing things that I normally would not. Or is that my real personality coming out that the stress, I, I don't know. But when I get stressed, things can happen. It's better with Jesus, I, I have to say. But there were times in my life when, 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 when stress would just make me do really awful things. And then I would think it was justified, or if not justified, you should certainly let it slide because of the stress I was under. Got a built-in excuse. Yeah, I know I was a jerk. <laughs> but not our hero. Not our hero. Even in this time of unimaginable stress, he is the same loving, kind, merciful, and charitable person that he was when there was no stress. He is who God is. And God is not dependent on outside forces now and forever. God is the same and we can see that here. Nothing can shake the character of God. And that, yes, is awesome. That is of incredible comfort to me. Because I know I try that. I give him reasons. A lot of reasons. To not be what he is. And he still is who he is. That's awesome news. That's really, really awesome news. When the chips are down, when we're folding like flies, when we're swinging swords and starting more trouble, God is exactly the same. Loving, kind, merciful, and charitable. And, and then, second point I want to make. You know, Jesus had options. He 
could have ended this at any moment he wanted to and had countless ways in which he could have done it. From beginning to the end of this scene, if you have eyes, it's stupidly obvious that the person in control the whole time is actually Jesus. And despite having total veto power over what happens here, it still ends with Jesus bound alone and on his way to Jerusalem to be tried and slaughtered. Therefore, the only conclusion that can be drawn is that this is happening because Jesus wants it to happen. And, and why would he want that to happen? Because it was the only way for him best, best to display that he is always loving, kind, merciful, and charitable. The stress from this point is just going to keep getting ratcheted up. And never once will Jesus stop being who he is. That's what love does. That's what true love is. When you look at, at 1 Corinthians 13, the, the love chapter, and love is patient and kind. Never was that on greater display than it was in these final hours of Jesus' life. Could have checked off a whole bunch of them just in this scene that we looked at. God, Jesus, is love. He did it because he is love. And this was the one display of love that he could show the whole world. And they couldn't deny. The only way they can deny this is, is, is to say that it didn't happen. can't really look at this and say that this wasn't the greatest display of love for others that anyone has ever, ever done, ever, ever put out there. To the very end, Jesus is, is, is proclaiming the good news and protecting those he loves and being merciful to sinners and, and, and to those who don't think they're sinners. He's, he's pointing out, you need me, you need me. You need me. That's a wonderful thing. That our God is that way. That he is that consistent. And he's not consistent at being mean. Or, or he's consistent at being love. And nothing, no outside circumstances can change that. Nothing the world can throw at God will make him not be love. That's really good news. Really, really good news. Father, we, we thank you that you are love and that you chose, you choose every day to love us. We don't deserve it. We certainly haven't earned it. We never will. And yet there you are. Suffering the blows. Taking the hatred. And continually being you. Loving, merciful, kind, good. Loving. We're so grateful for that. Lord, help us as we leave here. We get out into the streets. Find people. We're going to... There are people all over out there that don't know how much you love them. Help us, Lord, to tell them. 
Help us to be able to show them your love through us. and Tell them about your love so that so that they can know it too. Thank you for loving us this much. All this we ask in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, Lord willing, we'll see you next week. If there's anything we can do for you between now and then, reach out to us on our Facebook page um, our, or our website and, and call, send a message. Someone will get back to you. God bless you and uh, see you next week.